Yes. So today we turn to Spaywood, and it is important to begin by noting the differences between Spaywood and the other companies that we have been considering the last week or so. Spaywood was a British company and was, throughout the period involved, a relatively small company. While it manufactured some blood products, these were not widely used in the UK market. It's fair to describe them as being somewhat peripheral products. The company was also involved in a wide range of other activities. We will look at those as we go through. But there are three elements that are of particular interest to the inquiry. The first, and as we heard yesterday, is that Spaywood imported cutter product, Coate, and subsequently rebranded it as Humanate and sold it in the UK. The second aspect is the work that was done by Spaywood on human factor eight fractionation through a process called polyelectrolyte fractionation. We will hear evidence about what that was in due course. The product subsequently came to be called Mono 8C, but is often referred to in the documents as uh, the human factor 8 product, or words to that effect. The product was never widely produced, never widely used, and we will explore why that was. The techniques developed for Mono 8C were, however, very important in the origins of the recombinant factor eight story. And we will look at that today as well. The third element of interest to the inquiry of Spaywood's work was the production of porcine factor eight, again through polyelectrolyte fractionation. As the name suggests, porcine factor eight was produced from pig plasma. The product that was made using that technique was called Hi8C. It was primarily used for treating patients with factor VIII inhibitors and was not in general used for haemophilia patients who did not have inhibitors. And we will examine why that was. We will hear evidence later today from Sarah Middleton, who was, among other roles, the chief scientist at Spaywood for a period during the, uh, the early 80s, late 70s and early 80s. We'll hear her evidence after this presentation. What I say in the presentation is not intended in any way to preempt that evidence. Her analysis of the documents may be different to mine, and ultimately, sir, it will be for you to decide what your analysis is. The presentation, as with all of the presentations this week, will touch upon some of the documents. It's not exhaustive. It is not comprehensive. There are matters that we may have to return to later if that would be of assistance to you. And as, again, with all of the presentations in the last couple of weeks, it is limited by the access that we have to the papers. We have a lot of material, but we have by no means all of the material that we would like to have in order to tell the full story. Before turning to the products, it's helpful to have a look at the, the company structure and how that developed over time. A, help, a helpful way of doing that is by looking at the document IPSN 6027, please, Shumik. We can see from the front page of this document that it is a report prepared by Deloitte, Haskins and Sells, a firm of accountants, uh, a very eminent firm of accountants, and it is dated the 9th of December 1981, and the report is headed Spayward Laboratories Limited. The context of the report is that it was prepared ahead of a, a proposed joint investment in Spayward by the National Enterprise Board, which is a, was a government body that invested money in firms that were, it was hoped, going to go on and make a successful business within the UK, uh, and also an investment by Prutec Limited, which was the investment arm of 
prudential insurance. We will return in due course to the context of that investment and what happened around it. But for present purposes, the report is a, a helpful way of us understanding the, the company and the way that it was structured as of 1981. Could we have, please, the second page? We can see in the left-hand corner that the report is directed to D.A. Smart of Prutec Limited and I. Burns of the National Enterprise Board. It says, introduction, in accordance with the instructions contained in your letters of the 26th of October 1981, we have carried out an investigation into the affairs of Spaywood Laboratories Limited and its present subsidiaries, Spaywood Group, in connection with a proposed joint investment of four million pounds in Spaywood Laboratories Limited by Prutec Limited and the National Enterprise Board. The report refers to Spaywood throughout, and I'm going to do the same throughout this presentation. If we could go, please, to page three. The history and business section. The report says this. Spaywood was incorporated on the 19th of November, 1973. In 1974, the company purchased ethical drugs products from S. Moore and Sons, including animal plasma fractions for the treatment of haemophilia and xenilacin, an enzyme for the removal of cataracts. By 1978, the main trading activity of the company was the sale of coate, human factor eight imported from Cutter Laboratories. This distributorship was terminated by Cutter in 1980, although Spaywood are still able to obtain the product through a US intermediary. Spaywood continued to sell coate in the UK under the name of Humanate, but stopped in June 1981 when the product license was amended. Pause there, sir, to say that these are all matters that we will come on to in due course. On to the next page. Over the years, the company has been seeking to improve its animal plasma products. It has now developed a manufacturing process using polyelectrolytes developed by Monsanto. Porcine factor 8, produced by this process and sold as high HC, is now the company's main product. The report then goes on to list subsidiaries and former subsidiaries, and we can see that at various points there have been a a variety of businesses, a dietary food business, a television projection and ancillary equipment business, a, uh, a business entitled Vision Medical Limited. These had all either been sold off or had ceased trading, some with losses, um, and some sold at a profit. Uh, and then the final one is Cardio Technology Limited, and we can see that uh, that was sold uh, with 85% of a share capital to a Mr. P. Hammond, uh, who went on to become the Chancellor of the Exchequer. If we could go over to the next page, please. Some further businesses, uh, retail pharmacies, uh, and then a US company, Spaywood Corporation, and a West German company, Spaywood GmbH, which were intended to be uh, outlets into those two markets. But as the report says, the US company has never traded and the German company uh, is uh, intended to be used as an outlet, but um, at that stage, I, I don't think it was being used. These aren't companies that, uh, that will trouble us today. What is also clear from the report is that Spaywood is based in two centres. There is an office in Nottingham, or Nottinghamshire, I should say, and as we can see in the future plans section, a, uh, a 10,000 square foot factory of a Wrexham industrial estate leased from the Welsh Development Agency. Uh, if we could go over, please, to page uh, seven. This is a page containing details of a licensing agreement reached with the Monsanto company. We will, again, come back to some details of this, but I don't intend to go through the, uh, the fine detail of, of, of who had which rights. Uh, but you will see there, sir, that by 1981, there is a, a fairly 
detailed explanation of, of the relationship between Spayward and Monsanto. Uh, the crux of it is that Monsanto had licensed to Spayward the technique to use polyelectrolyte fractionation, both in porcine and human plasma. And in return, uh, Spayward had agreed to certain limitations on its rights to use the products that resulted from them. Although that version of the licensing agreement dates from the 15th of August 1981, there was a previous agreement as well. If we could now, Shumik, please go to page uh, 30 of the document. Under the heading Management and Staff, the report says, at the time of our review, Spayward employed 12 persons at Bingham, that is the Nottinghamshire site, and 21 at Wrexham. So we can see, sir, a, a much smaller company than those that we have been dealing with in the, in the recent days and weeks. The senior staff are D. Heath, Managing Director, P. Lees, Commercial Director, D. Williams, Marketing Director, and those names, David Heath, Peter Lees, and David Williams, will come up as we go through the presentation today. And then a few names down, Mrs. S. Middleton, Chief Scientist. That's Sarah Middleton, who will be giving evidence later today. If we could go back, please, Shumik, to page 27. Sorry, 26. The bottom half of that page, please, under the heading Share Capital. Uh, the accountant set out the current position as of 1981 on the, uh, the, the shares that were owned by the different equity holders in the company. Uh, the adjust, I'll, I will use the adjusted figures. Um, and we can see that an investment trust owns 32,000 shares, so that's about 40% of the company. A finance body owns a further 21,200 shares, so that's about... 26.5% of the company. Mr. Heath owns 18,800 shares. That's 23.5%. So about a, roughly a quarter of the company. And Mr. Lease and Mr. Williams have about 5% of the company each. So those are the equity holders. I merely note that Sarah Middleton is not one of the equity holders. She was the chief scientist and hence an employee of the company. Thank you, Shumik. We can take that down now. The pr proposed investment of £4 million pounds was, in fact, made in 1982 by Prutec and the National Enterprise Board. Both of those entities took 25% of the equity of the company, meaning that the 50% that was left uh, remained in the hands of the original investors, presumably uh, according to the same proportions. After that investment, a new chairman, Mr. Seymour, was appointed, and Mr. James Mottram became the general manager in 1983. His brief, according to the documents that we have, was to, and I quote, reorganise Spaywood into a classical UK pharmaceutical company. The reference for that is IPSN 40166 and underscore 019. Mr Heath and Mr Williams subsequently left the company and we will hear a little evidence about the, the circumstances in which that took place and the disputes that uh, gave rise to it. In 1984, the company was acquired by Porton International. It was later 
acquired by Ibsen Biofarm Limited. Just for your note, Ms Middleton, from whom we will hear later, left the company in 1984, just before it was acquired by Porter. Turning then to the importation and sale of factor concentrates. As we heard yesterday, there was an agreement, a distribution agreement, between Spayward Laboratories and Cutter Laboratories so that Spayward could import and sell within the UK the factor eight product Coate. The agreement itself is at IPSN Four zeros one three nine underscore zero zero three. It ran for three years from June nineteen seventy six. I won't take you to the agreement, sir, but it is there uh, for future consideration should that be necessary. A product license PL zero three seven zero slash three zero four was granted to Spayward for Co eight in August 1976. The reference I have for that is IPSN 40312 underscore 036. We know, and as we heard yesterday, that Cutter had originally submitted an application for CO8, but Spaywood, in effect, took this on. There is correspondence to that effect, which is BAYP 50s. 20 underscore 046. Unfortunately, sir, we don't have at present the documents that will help to answer the questions that we raised yesterday about the level of detail that was provided before the licence was granted. And to what extent further information was provided about the, the source of plasma and the way in which donors were, were selected and indeed rejected. That is something that we will continue to explore. We will seek to work with others within the inquiry uh, as well to see if they can show, shed any light on it. But at present, I'm afraid I can't take that story any further. We know that there was some further correspondence about packaging of the hepatitis warning in October 1976. Uh, a reference is IPSN four zeros, three one two, underscore zero four zero. The warning itself, and perhaps we could bring this up, Shumik, is at IPSN four zeros, three two nine, underscore zero zero one. Here we can see the data sheet for CO8. And the product license is there on the left-hand side, the address of Spayward. And of note, sir, is that the address given is the Bingham address, the Nottingham address, and not the Wrexham address. There may be a significance to that as we go through. If we could... Give me one second, Shuman. We could go to the second page, please. The contraindications and warnings. It says there are no known contraindications to CO8. Hepatitis. CO8 is prepared from units of human plasma, each donation of which has been found non-reactive for hepatitis B antigen when tested by radioimmune assay. In addition, each batch has also been tested against hepatitis by radioimmune assay. However, despite these tests and the precautions taken in selecting donors, the risk of transmitting serum hepatitis cannot be excluded. Thank you, Shimmy. The product was on sale from Spaywood from the 1st of November 1976. The reference for that is IPSN 40312 
underscore zero three eight. We have some sales figures from November 1976 to October 1977. And please, could we have this on screen, please, Shumik? IPSN 40146. Very helpfully set out per haemophilia center uh, with a grand total at the bottom. We can see that we're not entirely comparing like with like because the, some of the centres have been using the product for longer than others. Bristol has been using it for a full 12 months compared to St Thomas's just using it for five. More than half a million units, uh, and I take that to mean international units, had been sold to Oxford, then about just over 300,000 units to Liverpool. If we go down to the bottom, please, Shumik, we can say that the total sales for that period, November 76 to October 77, 12-month period, is 2.7 million units. And those sales so were achieved despite not tendering for the NHS central contract that we have seen in some of the other presentations, uh, we will return to this matter, and indeed for the, reason, uh, the reasons why Spaywood didn't tender that contract, when we come back to look at some of the evidence from civil servants and government ministers. Uh, a reference so that we have it for when we come back is DHSC 303719 underscore 098, which explains Spaywood's thinking at that time. David Williams, the marketing director, one of the names that we saw in the accountant's report, met with leading haemophilia clinicians between August 1978 and January 1979 to discuss their factor concentrate usage, and the inquiry has considered some of the notes that he made of those meetings when examining each of the centres. So I, I won't take you through each one, but they're helpful ways of getting a snapshot of, of what the centre was doing at the time. I will, however, just highlight one for present purposes, which is IPSN 40334 underscore 019. We can see from the file note that this is Mr. Williams' meeting with Professor Bloom at the University Hospital of Wales on the 24th of August, 1978. I'm going to read through all of this notes. Uh, there will be some things that I focus on now, which are to do with uh, product uh, sales, and some things that I will come back to in due course, which in particular concerns polyelectrolyte fractionation. The initials PE, as we'll see on this note, refer to polyelectrolyte fractionation. What Mr. Williams said in the note is this. There are 250 haemophiliacs attached to this centre, of which 100 are regular attenders and 13 inhibitors. Until recently, human factor eight purchases have been split three ways. Haemophil Factor 8 and L Street. They have now stopped using armour following the hepatitis problem. I just pause there to note that, although it's not clear from this document, that may relate to reports in 1977 and 1978 of adverse reactions and hepatitis infection through the use of the armour product. Prices are haemophil 11p and factor 8 9.5p, factor 8 being the armour product. Bloom used to favour immuno, but as this is now 16p, he never buys. He is not interested in the administration kits, but prefers to make his own up in the hospital. I offered coate at 10 pence for 50,000 unit lots 
and I'm reasonably confident that we will get some of the business. Bloom always likes to keep two suppliers, but is reluctant to make frequent changes. Bloom is obviously not an animal lover, although he is interested in our work. I pause there, so that's a slightly cryptic reference, I believe, to porcine factor eight. He is prepared to look at the new material when available. He referred to Rizza's suggestion that use of porcine increased the inhibitor level to human. He also felt that the present material was too antigenic and expressed doubts as to the likelihood of our reducing this to a level which, would, which he would regard as satisfactory. I think it's important that we provide him with clinical evidence as soon as possible. Perhaps Jean-Pierre could prepare some notes. I pause there, sir, to say that we will be coming back to this, but Professor Bloom's reaction to the possible use of porcine factor eight is, I would suggest, fairly typical of the view at that time in 1978. And we will come on to see uh, how that view changed, or indeed whether it changed in due course. Bloom would like some PE to help with new research project of his looking at the biochemistry of human factor eight. He has a research worker starting in January 1979 to work full time on this subject. We could arrange to have first option on the results. PPF was at one time rationed in his area, but is now issued on a first come, first served basis. There is never enough available, partly because the health service does not produce sufficient, partly because of a high price. Bloom felt that there was a place for commercial material if it could be produced more cheaply. We should obviously investigate. And the date of the note is 31st of August 1978, and we can see at the bottom that it was copied to Mr. Heath. As I say, sir, there are a number of other similar notes. I'm going to give some references for the transcript so that people uh, have those in case they're of, of use to them. Um, I will point out that in one of them, which concerns Dr. Stewart at Birmingham, uh, he says that he hadn't heard about any hepatitis problem in connection with the armour product. Uh, that is IPSN 40333 underscore 022. The other references are IPSN 40332 underscore 021. IPSN 40334 underscore 019. IPSN 40331 underscore 008. IPSN 40333 underscore 022. IPSN 40338 underscore 011. And IPSN 40321 underscore 026. The prices that were offered to the various clinicians varied. Some of that variation is due to different amounts of product being offered. As you observed the other day, so there is generally a discount for bulk. However, there is also an attempt to negotiate with individual clinicians to try to get their business, in essence. As we've seen in that letter, 10 pence was offered to Professor Bloom. Uh, 9.5 pence for 1 million international units was offered to Dr. Kernoff at the Royal Free in January 1979. 9 pence was offered in a draft letter, uh, seemingly to the, to the whole Haemophilia Centre directors, dated 1980. The reference of that is IPSN 40325 underscore 001. Dr. Preston was offered 9.25 pence in August 1979 and 8.5 pence by May 1980. Reference is IPSN 403T2 underscore 006 and the same stem underscore 003. The pattern, as you will have observed, sir, is generally a, a falling one. In December 1979, an issue arose about the potency claimed for coate on its labelling. 
what appears to have happened is that when the product was tested by NIBSC and by the individual haemophilia centres, they found that their assays did not accord with the potency that was stated on the label. If we could go, please, Shumik, to IPSN 40575. We'll see some of the correspondence about this. The date is the 4th of December 1979. And the letter is going from David Williams to Mr. C. Jones of Cutter Laboratories. And as we will see, it's not only raising the problem, but also raising the point that Spaywood would like compensation from Cutter for the difficulties and the financial difficulties that the problem had given rise to. What Mr. Williams says in the letter is that the um, situation with respect to, as he terms them, suspect batches of co is as follows. Uh, and we can see there four batches listed down. And we can see in the second column the assigned potency, which I take to mean the potency that was stated on the label. You can also see the quantity received the current stock and how much had been sold. In the paragraph below, Mr. Williams says, as you will realise from the quantity involved, we have a major problem. On the one hand, we are desperately short of good stock and clearly we dare not sell new batches without first obtaining NIBS clearance. So your urgent help with prompt dispatches is of paramount importance. The other side of the coin is that we have two major and influential customers Oxford and Newcastle, reluctant to trust our assay figures and insisting on their own check prior to acceptance. But he gives some further detail on each of the batches. The first batch, C1090, if we look back at the table, we can see that its assigned potency was 1100. Mr. Williams, in his letter, says that C1090 was not acceptable to NIBS unless we relabel at 900. My own view is that this should be returned to USA. So NIBSC has run its tests, found that the potency figure that they can obtain using their tests is around 900, and are insisting that the product is relabeled to show that potency if it is to be sold in the UK. This is an example, sir, of the stop orders that we have heard reference made to uh, and the suggestion from Mr Williams is that that product should be sent back to Qatar uh, and presumably uh, Spaywood would be compensated for the cost of it um, the second lot considered is NC8160 which has been extensively used in Oxford and Newcastle and is the subject of an attached letter from Rizzer and Jones. We don't have that letter. Uh, Nibs obtained 210 and cleared at 230. Repeat assays at Oxford indicate 185. What I take that to mean, sir, is that when Nibs, the assigned potency as we can see from the table on the previous page, is 230. NIBS, in their tests, obtained 210. A, a figure of the, the units don't matter, but a, a figure of 210 for the potency. So about 10% below that which was claimed. I read that as meaning that NIBS were content to clear the product as saying that it had a potency of 230 presumably allowing some leeway for a, a potential difference in test, testing. But when the product was then tested uh, at Oxford, the potency was 185, which appears to have prompted a complaint to Spaywood about the product. Mr. Williams goes on to say that for, for the present, I've supplied replacement material free of charge to both centres. Probably the simple way out financially is to give them units equivalent to their loss, say 20% or 126,000 units. Obviously, we will be looking to cut it for compensation. So the fact that the 
product is not as potent as claimed means that more will have to be used, hence that figure of 20%. They will build up the stockpile uh, to replace that which the centres should have had. And as is stated in terms there, Spayward are looking to cut for compensation on that. So Spayward very much seeing this as a, a problem of cutters making. Uh, NC8185, this was cleared by NIBS at label declaration, although their assay was around 10% low. Again, sir, showing that there is a degree of leeway allowed by NIBSC. But as we can see from NC8184, uh, NIBS again got 900 and will not clear without relabel. The claimed potency was 1130. So the leeway only extends so far before NIBS using stop orders say you can't distribute this product without uh, relabeling it. Um, What Mr. Williams says about that product is, I originally stated that we would resell to France at label strength. And in fact, we have sold them 200,010 units. However, in view of total problem, I feel it is not sensible to continue this policy. Uh, I would say that um, there is a, a further document, sir, uh, IPSN 40291, which is dated the 21st of February 1980. Uh, which shows that uh, after further thought, Spaywood had decided not to sell product to France uh, when NIBS has said that it must be relabeled. And one of the reasons that is given for that policy is that Duncan Thomas of NIBSC is in regular contact with his French opposite number, and it would be embarrassing of the companies involved to be found to be selling with one label in one country and one label in the other country. Although I should add uh, that it's important to note that in his letter of the 21st of February 1980, uh, Mr. Williams also refers to a basic moral issue that is involved as well. So it is not just a cynical attempt to avoid being caught. Um, the further point made by Mr. Williams in his letter of the 4th of December 1979, a little further down the page, please. Thank you, Shumik. Is, uh, of course, any recommendations on these bat batches could change if your technical people can resolve the matter with NIBS. I do hope you can achieve an agreement quickly. So there is some thought that this may be a, a technical issue, perhaps, about how the, the different tests work. Thank you, Shumik. We can take that down. I leave that there, sir, but it is an example of the way in which the, the licensing system works its way through at, at different levels. Turning to the switch of products from Coate to Humanate. The June 1976 distribution agreement between Cutter and Spayward ran for three years and it appears that it was terminated at the end of 1979, Cutter then began supplying Coate directly to the UK market. We heard something about that yesterday. The references are IPSN 40331 underscore 001 and MHRA 0036365 underscore 018. In February 1980, Spayward obtained a variation to their product license, allowing them to continue selling Coate for up to one year, and also allowing them to import unlicensed, uh, sorry, to import unlabeled factor concentrate manufactured by Cutter 
for relabeling and for sale under the name Humanate. I'm afraid, sir, that we don't have the documents that accompanied that license variation application. Or at least we, we haven't identified them if we do have them. We, our information is taken from a, a later uh, licensing um, issue, which we will come on to. The reference is MHRA 00363651018. underscore zero one eight. According to company records, the last coate batch imported by Spaywood was released by the DHSS, so that's released by NIBSC, in February 1980. The reference is IPSN 40139 underscore 022. That product, of course, would have had a longer shelf life, but the last time that a Spaywood sale under the licensing agreement uh, seems to have been cleared by NIBSC was February 1980. The way in which Spaywood began to sell Humanate uh, can be shown by, the let by a letter that was sent to Dr. Aaron Stam, the Trelaws Centre, uh, by Mr. Williams on the 30th of July 1980. The reference is IPSN 40331 underscore 001. Again, sir, I'm going to read all of the letter through. There are matters that we will come back to later, but I think it's important to show how the, the different strands of Spaywood's work, the human factor rate, the porcine factor rate, and the sale of imported products all work together. Although we're going to be looking at them individually for purposes of analysis, they are running alongside each other all the time. What Mr. Williams said is this, and I quote, Dear Tony, as you are aware, Spaywood are the only British-owned company researching new blood fractionation techniques and the isolation of highly purified plasma proteins for clinical use. The first successful result of our research program is the availability of a preparation of porcine factor 8C, high 8C, for the treatment of inhibitor patients. This product has now been used for the first time in man. We are delighted to report that the treatment in a life-threatening situation was entirely problem-free. Thrombocytopenia was completely absent and there were no antigenic re reactions. It would therefore appear that the criteria for use of porcine material can now be relaxed. I'll come back to that later. We are now working hard to produce human 8C and a VWF, von Willebrand's fraction, concentrate. Initial clinical samples will be ready by the end of this summer. Financing this research has been a major difficulty for such a small company as ours. For the first four years, we relied on our profits from sales of Cutter's Coate to provide the cash. Cutter are now selling direct and, to fill the gap, we have arranged the supply of a high-quality, freeze-dried Factor 8 product under our own trademark, Humanate. Humanate is not an intermediate product and has a specific activity of approximately one AHF unit per milligram of protein. It is readily soluble and ideal for home treatment. A leaflet and data sheet giving further information are enclosed. Pack sizes are nominal 250, 500, and 1,000 units. Our price for Humanate is 7.5 pence per unit, delivered regardless of quantity, which we hope will give you some saving over current prices. Administration kits are available free of charge. If required, we can normally guarantee delivery within 24 hours. I do hope you'll be able to give us some support and use Humanate for part of your treatment programme. He says that he's sending a, a copy of this letter to Brian Grundy in Southampton. Mm -hmm. 
one point that I would pick up from the letter, sir, is the, the reference to human ape being, and I quote, not an intermediate product. You've heard evidence about the distinctions drawn between intermediate purity and high purity product. And it was Dr. Kingdon's evidence uh, in his witness statement, CBLA 5011 underscore 005, at paragraph 31, that in the, the he's referring to the 1970s, but this letter is from 30th of July 1980. Uh, his evidence was that high purity was between one and two international units per milligram. What is claimed for the product Humanate is that uh, the specific activity is approximately one AHF unit per milligram, which perhaps explains the, the, the slightly odd wording of Humanate being, quote, not an intermediate product, but it is not claimed that it is a high purity product. Shumik, can we have on screen, please, BAYP 5021 underscore 023. At the top right hand corner, please. This appears to be a, a data sheet for Humanate. And in the top right hand corner, I'm afraid it's a very poor copy, we can see that it's written Humanate is prepared from human. It looks like Venus. Venus plasma? Yes, I think Venus plasma. Each unit of donor plasma has been tested for hepatitis B surface antigen by radioimmune assay technique and found non-reacting. However, the test does not necessarily preclude the presence of hepatitis virus. That appears to be the warning that accompanied Humanate as of circa 1980. Two things are clear from other documents. The first is that Humanate was coate being sold under a different name. We saw reference to that in the accountant's report that we looked at earlier, and a further reference should it be needed is BAYP 5021 underscore 063. Second, the product was not obtained directly from Qatar, but through an independent company called Palia Medical Support, sorry, Palia Medical Supply Company, which was based in San Francisco. The reference for that is MHRA 0036365 underscore 018. On the first of these points, could we have on screen, please, IPSN, Four zeros three three eight underscore zero zero one. A letter dated the thirty first of October, nineteen eighty. So a few months after the, the letter that we looked at a moment ago, uh, and sent from Mr. Williams to Dr. Evans of the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. The section that I'd like to look at now is the second um, and third paragraphs. What Mr. Williams says is, and I quote, Humanate is manufactured for us by Cutter Laboratories, so is identical to the product which we have previously sold as their agent. That's coate. I will be grateful if you can keep this information confidential. So what you've just um, told me means that that's a lie. Uh, Does it? Uh, no, sir. I, I, Manufactured for us because it was bought from a, an intermediary, not direct. Uh, it, it was bought with the knowledge, I believe, of Cutter. So, I, I, so it, 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 Cutter manufactured it for Spaywood by, and sold it through an intermediary. As I understand the position to be, yes, sir. I see. Um, so it was manufactured for them. Uh, so far as... I can ascertain from the documents. It was certainly manufactured with their not, with, well, it was within Cutter's knowledge that Spayward were doing this. 
well. And I, I that, think that, that, that's, that's, that's a rather different issue. Uh, you may know that somebody's manufacturing mm -hmm. or selling something which you actually made, but you may not want them to do it. Uh, you may not, I, I don't know, but I've seen no evidence to suggest that uh, Cutter didn't want them to do it. And Cutter could have entered into an arrangement with the, the Parlier Medical Supply Company to ensure that they didn't do it. And that, at least at this stage, does not appear to have been... The, at, at some stage, they, uh, they used the word pirate product, Cutter. They, there is a, a tension which develops, and we saw some of that in some of the documents yesterday. Um, the... The question, but that's, that's not yet this stage. But, uh, uh, so far as I can tell, that's not yet this stage. Um, but there is a, a tension which does develop. Uh, and uh, we will see shortly um, that there is also a, a tension within the licensing position yes. of Spaywood. Um, what I take from this document, though, is that Mr. Williams is prepared to answer a what appears to have been a question from... Dr. Evans, uh, and say this is coate and it's made by Cutter. But as we have seen from a previous letter from Dr. Aronstam, there is a uh, there, there was a, an opaqueness, if I may put it that way, as to what the product was. It was certainly not said to Dr. Aronstam that this is coate. Uh, and it was not said, indeed, that it was a, a cutter product. Um, uh, no, sorry, it was said that it was a cutter product. It says, no, sorry, I apologise, it was not. It said, we have arranged the supply of a high-quality freeze-dried Factor 8 product under our own trademark, Juminate. So no further information given there about the source of that product. But seemingly in response to a request from Dr Evans, Mr Williams does explain where the product is from, but then asks Dr. Evans to keep that information confidential. We will come back to this letter uh, about the, the porcine product uh, in due course. Um, if we could go forward, sir, to um, just a, a few months this is the document that we did see yesterday. Uh, BAYP 5021-063. Please, Shumik. This is the board meeting of uh, Cutter Laboratories Limited, the UK-based company, held on Tuesday, the 16th of December, 1980. As I say, Ms. Richards showed us this yesterday. If we could go down, please, to the central uh, paragraph under the heading Coate. It says, it was agreed that the managing director, Mr. B.A. Dios, would put together a full situation report regarding Coate and also the Spaywood parallel product known as Humanate, which was, in fact, Coate mar marketed under a different label. It was agreed that this situation report was important and should receive full priority. Um, a little further on, there's a discussion about sales, and if we pick it up three lines from the bottom, it was said, it should be possible to price Humanate out of the market, coupled with the fact that NIBSAC and Dr. Duncan Thomas were very concerned regarding Humanate and the impossibility of tracing its manufacturer back to its source. So concerns... Uh, within Cutter Laboratories Limited about the market position, if I may put it that way, of uh, Coate in respect of this other product and a desire to price it out of the market. And also an indication that the licensing authority was concerned. And that is the second element that I'll pick up now, the, the significance of the use of Parlier Medical Supply Company. Um, The concerns flagged there in the minutes, uh, the specific reference to Dr. Thomas, uh, led, in fact, to a, a variation of the license that had been granted to Spaywood for Humanate. 
and it's helpful to examine that process in a, in a little detail, again, because it assists us with our understanding of, of the way the licensing process worked. If we could have on screen the Schumich, MHRA 0036365 underscore 001. We can see that this, these are the minutes of the Committee on the Safety of Medicines, that's the main committee, uh, a meeting held on the Thursday, the 22nd of January, 1981. So the first minute, uh, sorry, the first meeting of, of 1981, and uh, just a, a month or so after the previous document that we looked at. There's a list of attendees. Uh, I, I note in passing that uh, Dr. J. Smith, Dr. Joseph Smith is there from whom uh, we've heard evidence. And among the committee secretariat for hearing two only are Dr. Fowler and Dr. Holgate. Uh, hearing two, as we will see, concerns Spaywood and Humanate. We could turn, please, Schumick, to page three of that document. Under the heading Hearings, it says Human 8, Spaywood Laboratories. A record of the committee's findings in respect of the above is included at appendices B and C to these minutes. And it is appendix C to which we will turn because that records the discussion on Human 8. And that is at MHRA 203635 underscore zero one eight. You can see top right hand corner appendix C to CSM eighty one first meeting, hearing two. Medical assessor is Dr. Fowler and the product is human aid. We're going to go through this document in, in a little detail, uh, partly because this is the information that we have about the original variation that allowed human aid to be sold in the UK. We don't have further papers, um, or at least we haven't found further papers. Uh, we will continue to look for them because it will be interesting to see how the, the original variation was granted. Background. Since 1976, Spaywood Laboratories Limited has had sold anti-hemophilic globulin, factor eight, manufactured by Cutter Laboratories under the name co in the United Kingdom. This arrangement had been terminated by Cutter at the end of 1979. In February 1980, Spaywood had obtained a variation to their product license, which permitted them to A, continue selling their remaining stocks of co for up to one year, and B, import in bulk unlabeled vials of anti-hemophilic globulin manufactured by Cutter for relabeling and sale under the name Humanate. The material for sale as Humanate was not obtained from Cutter, but through an independent company called Parlier Medical Supply Company of San Francisco, California. At the time of granting the Spaywood product license for Coate in 1976, a full stop order had been routinely applied. This had required the license holder to supply samples and protocols of tests above on every batch of product and not to sell or supply material from a batch until a certificate of clearance for it had been granted by the licensing authority. Spaywood had complied with this requirement for co by supplying samples and protocols obtained from Cutter to the National Institute of Biological Standards and Control. I pause there, sir. That is why we have that exchange about the, the potency of the products and the relabeling. Paragraph 1.5. The protocol supplied to NIBSC by Spaywood for their first batch of Humanate has provided results of tests done on the finished product by a British contract laboratory. These had followed very closely those done by Cutter for Coate, but the protocol had omitted material included in the Coate protocol concerning the bulk active substance used for formulation, uh, for formulation, formulation and filling. The Coate protocol had also contained Cutter's statement that the product had been manufactured by them at their plant in Berkeley, California. Although the tests done on the finished product were satisfactory, 
the protocol had been deemed inadequate as it was impossible to assess the safety of a blood product by reference to finished blood pr uh, product testing alone. Spay would have repeatedly said that they now had no contact with Cutter and thus had no access to information relating to the manufacture of a product they were selling. Over the page. Moreover, the product license granted to Spayward had obliged the company to ensure that all batches of the product continued to conform to the various specifications contained in the original application. While Spayward had acted as distributors for Cutter, they had been able to do this. Now that they had no contact with Cutter, they were no longer in a position to guarantee that the product sold as Humidate conformed to its product license specification. If, in fact, Cutter were the original manufacturers of Humanate, as claimed by Spayward, they could have changed the source, place, or method of manufacture of a product, and Spayward would have been unaware of this and unable to communicate such changes to the licensing authority. The scientists at the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control frequently had to refer back to the company for clarification or further information concerning the manufacture of a product. Where the license holder was the manufacturer, manufacturer or his authorised distributor, this posed no problems. Where the license holder had no communication with the manufacturer, as in Spaywood's case, such a dialogue was impossible. As a matter of routine, the additional conditions contained in the schedule to the product license issued to Spaywood referred to protocols, but no mention was made therein to the contents required in respect of such protocols. This lack of information was unsatisfactory, particularly in regard to biological products of this type in question. So, as to remedy the situation, it has been proposed under Section 29.1, using powers conferred under Section 28.3G of the Medicines Act 1968, compulsorily to vary Spaywood's product license in order to require the protocols to include evidence of the source and date of collection of the donor blood from which the product was prepared, the date of manufacture and the results of tests done during and on completion of manufacture. This would have put beyond doubt the nature of the evidence required when the term protocol was used and would have served to bring Spaywood into line with the current practice of other manufacturers of anti-hemophilic globulin. I pause there, sir, to, to summarise what I understand the position to be, that the use of the intermediary company meant that NIBSC were unable to satisfy themselves that there was a chain that they could follow all of the way back to the manufacturers of the product in order to understand how the product was manufactured. And the, the, well, the, way, the way I understand it is, is that, um, leave aside the, the intermediary, there was no direct link between um, Cutter uh, and Spaywood anymore. Yes. So Spaywood didn't have the information. Yes. Um, and... It begs the question, going back to what I raised earlier in the letter to Evans, uh, how one could say that Cutter was making it for Spaywood. Yes. Uh, I will jump, if I may, to paragraph 1.10, um, um, which records that the licensing authority wrote to the company on the 27th of November 1980, stating their, very, uh, their proposal to vary the product license. Uh, and the wording is given, which I, I, I won't go through now because it will come up again. Uh, and on the 30th of July 1980, the company had written to the committee giving notice that they intended to avail themselves of the opportunity to appear before the committee to ensure that their position was fully understood. So this is for working through the Medicines Act 1968. The licensing authority is proposing to vary. The company has an opportunity to put its case. Uh, and this... Um, report from, a, uh, uh, from Dr. Fowler is part of the, the process that then follows. Um, paragraph 2, uh, uh, or section 2, additional information. Uh, the company had submitted a paper giving the background to their case and why the variation to the license should not be um, uh, imposed. On the day of the hearing, the company handed in a copy of a notarized statement from Parlier Medical Supply Company which certified that bulk unlabeled anti-hemophilic factor, human, shipped to Spaywood was, one, manufactured and sold by Cutter Laboratories, two, approved and released for general sale in the USA 
by the FDA, Bureau of Biologics Division, and three, derived from human plasma collected in plasmapheresis centres licensed by and conforming to the regulations of the US Bureau of Biologics. Preliminary discussion. The following points emerged from the preliminary discussion. One, that 4% of the batches supplied for testing in 1980 came from Spaywood. Two, that of the 50% of the batches from US sources, there had been need to refer back to the manufacturers. I understand that to mean that in 50% of the cases where batches of uh, uh, factor concentrates are tested, there's a need to go back to the manufacturer to ask them some questions which shows the importance of having that chain going all the way back. At three, that Spaywood were merely being asked to give information which was routinely supplied by all other manufacturers of antihemophilic globulin sold in the UK. For, uh, section four, the hearing. The representatives of the company were as follows. Mr. Williams, the spokesman, and Dr. Jones from uh, Newcastle. The company's representatives were welcomed by the chairman who introduced the committee, the secretariat, and the DHSS officials present. The representatives had no objection to the presence of any officials. Mr. Williams referred to the affidavit from Parlier Medical Supply Company, which had been furnished, and with the aid of slides, explained that the cutter material was subject to cutter in-house quality control before submission to the FDA stroke BOB for clearance. The material was purchased after clearance and thus its integrity was in his view guaranteed. Following delivery to Parlier Medical Supply Company, all packaging was removed and the product shipped into, intact to the UK. On arrival in the UK, the unlabeled material was subject to quality control carried out in the laboratories of Toxicol and the Oxford Haemophilia Centre. Samples were then submitted to NIBSC together with protocols and following approval the material was repackaged as Humanate. He considered that all FACT8 products carried a risk of non-A, non-B hepatitis, but that, but that the risk was minimised by monitoring of donors by the FDA. Mr Williams felt that any additional data could be obtained from the FDA, possibly by NIBSC, under the US Freedom of Information Act. He explained that his objective in appearing before the committee was to seek an extension of the present arrangements to enable the company to make other arrangements, if possible, for the purchase of Factor 8 and eventually to remove the company's financial dependence on this imported Factor 8. Dr Jones then explained that he had come to the hearing as an independent consultant, unpaid, to advise the committee that in his capacity as director of a haemophilia centre, he had satisfactorily treated patients with Humanate. In reply to questions, Mr Williams stated that he thought that, if necessary, donors of blood might be traced from cutters' records by means of the Freedom of Information Act. He had accepted that the batches he imported, unlabeled, were consistent with cutter batches because of the assurances given by Parlier Medical Supply. Mr Williams said that he did not know of any other manufacturer who was asked to provide the information required. Findings. The, committees found, the committee found that there was insufficient evidence of any firm arrangement which would enable Spayward to obtain the data specified in paragraph 1.9. We didn't... Uh, sorry, well, no, that's not on coming off my screen at the moment. Uh, section 5 of page 4 of the document. Fine. Thank you. The committee found that there was insufficient evidence of any firm arrangement which would enable Spaywood to obtain the data specified in 1.9. Um, if we can go back now, please, Schumick, to page 2 and to 1.9, I'll read out what that data is. Um, what paragraph 1.9 says is, following the licensing authority proposals, a letter had been sent to the company on the 29th of July 1980 in accordance with sections 28 and 29 Schedule and Schedule 2 of Medicines Act 1968. It had informed the company in accordance with paragraph 2 of Schedule 2 that the committee had reason to think that they may have to advise the licensing authority to vary the product license for this product. So that paragraph 6 of... Well, the, the, the information is the last uh, five lines, six lines. Yes, it? so it's proposing varying the product so that uh, the information... Uh, uh, so that it contains 
the license holder should on request furnish to the licensing authority from every batch of a product. Um, Um, a sample of such amount as the authority considered adequate for any examination. The license holder should have required by the licensing authority furnish evidence of the source and date of the collection of the donor blood from which the product was prepared, the date of manufacture of the product, an outline of manufacturing methods, protocols and results of tests done on, uh, on the donor blood during manufacture uh, and on the finished product. So that's the information that uh, the committee accepted was necessary, and they accepted the point made to them um, by the licensing authority that there was no way that Spaywood could obtain that data. The advice that the committee then gave, and it's important to remember that the committee is not the decision-making body. The licensing authority is the decision-making body, but under these circumstances, it must consult the committee. The advice that the committee gave uh, was to vary the product. Well, well let, let's have a look at that because we're still back on page, um, paragraph 1.10. Yep. It, it's we need to go to paragraph page five, 6, don't please. we? Shumik. Uh, shall we go back to the previous page? Page 4, please, Shumik. Advice. At the bottom of the page. So the advice that is being given is to vary the license to include the following words, and that's on page 5. I quote, the license holder shall on request furnish to the licensing authority from every batch of a product or from some such batch or batches as the licensing authority may from time to time specify a sample of such amount as the authority may consider adequate for any examination required to be made. And the license holder shall, if required by the licensing authority, furnish evidence of a source and date of collection of the donor blood from which the product is prepared, the date of manufacture of the product, an outline of manufacturing methods, protocols, and results of tests done on the donor blood during manufacturing and on the finished product. So it's accepting the argument that had been made by the licensing authority as to the, the information that was required. The reasons for the advice, if we could go back, please, Schumick, that because of the risk to patients arising from lack of evidence as to the origins and provenance of the donor blood, the committee were not satisfied as to the safety underlined of the product. That was the advice given by the committee. Um, I don't have a document for you, sir, showing the decision of the licensing authority, but it is clear that there was a product variation and that as a result of that product variation, Spaywood ceased to sell Humanate um, you, you, you mean license variation? The li sorry, license variation, yes. Um, the, the accountant's report that we looked at earlier, IPSN 5027, page 3, says in terms, quotes, Spay would continue to sell Coate in the UK under the name of Humanate, but stopped in June 1981 when the product license was amended. I don't know, sir, why there is a gap between uh, this consideration, which is taking place in January 1981 and uh, the ceasing of the sales of Coate in June 1981. Uh, we don't have the... W what was it, sales of Coate? Well, uh, uh, sorry, of Humanate. Um, the, it's, it's fair to say that the accountant's report um, doesn't cite uh, the, the, resources, the, the resources that it's using, and nor was this its principal focus. So I'm afraid we, we simply don't know why there is that uh, um, seeming gap and the significance, if any, of it. Um, I'm going to turn very briefly, so if I may, before the break, because I've nearly finished the section on uh, Humanate and Coate. Um, there were a number of adverse incidents um, in the use of Humanate, uh, Glasgow Royal Infirmary reported possible NA and B infection in three patients in a letter to Spaywood in January 1981. 
and later, in March 1981, expressed their view that it was highly probable, those were the words they used, that human eight was responsible for that infection. The references are IPSN 40336 underscore 005 and the same stem underscore 002. There were also reports from Trelaws and Bournemouth of apparent allergic reactions to human eight in February 1981. IPSN 40323 underscore 002 and the same stem underscore 003. It may be that these concerns prompted the following letter, which was sent by Professor Bloom in March 1981. It's DHSC301191. I'm afraid it's a very poor copy. It is dated the 10th of March 1981. It is sent to Dr. Holgate at the DHSS. I, I will try my best to read from it. Um, Dr. Bloom says at the start that he is writing in his official capacity as chairman of the Haemophilia Centre Directors of the UK. Uh, and he is referring to, um, it says, the problem of... I, At a meeting of reference centre directors, the problem of um, something impurities... But, it is, it's for something that I'm afraid I, I can't assist with. But it is a, referring to impurities um, in uh, factor rate um, concentrates, and in particular, humanate. Um, if we go to the second paragraph and the first legible sentence of it, the first concerns the preparation of humanate, about which there was some adverse publicity in the national press recently. My colleagues and I would like to be reassured that this material has been cleared for use and has passed the normal control processes for the UK. We would like to be reassured that it is possible from the protocol to trace actual batches to source in the event of an outbreak of hepatitis, etc., attributable to it. Most of us are aware of rumours that this material or, uh, originates with an American company and is solved through brokerage or other means to Spaywood Laboratories Limited, where it is relabeled. This seemed to us to be somewhat regular, and we would greatly appreciate your advice on its current status. Um, if we could go to the final paragraph. The Haemophilia Reference Centre directors have expressed disquiet at these developments, although we are aware that by virtue of plasma brokerages in the USA, it may be difficult sometimes to be sure of the exact origin of plasma used in any of the currently available concentrates. These problems highlight the importance of developing a UK potential within the health service to supply all the needs of British haemophiliacs. I would be very grateful for your advice. So that is the concern that is being raised in March 1981 with Dr Holgate. His reply is that BPLL... 301351 underscore 039. Date of the 23rd of March, 1981. Dr. Holgate wrote, Dear Professor Bloom, thank you for your letter of the 10th of March drawing our attention to the recent disturbing press reports concerning Factor 8 concentrate and enclosing a copy of a letter given to you by Dr. Savage. As I am sure you are aware, one of the cornerstones of our philosophy for licensing of biological products is to have detailed knowledge of and control over early stages of manufacturing and in-process in control. This including source material. I am particularly delighted to have your clearly expressed support for this attitude. With regard to Humanate and Spaywood Laboratories Limited, I can say no more at this stage as the matter is being dealt with at the present time. This uh, may reflect the strict confidentiality that surrounded the meetings of the Committee on the Safety of Medicine. We can see that as of the 23rd of March 1981, 
uh, at least according to Dr. Holgate's letter, uh, the matter is still being dealt with, the, the process is still running. But as we know, uh, they were aware of concerns predating Professor Bloom's letter and uh, had proposed a variation of the licence as a result. Well, well, Professor Bloom was referring to some, spec uh, some press comment, I think, wasn't he? Uh, he, he was. Um, so the, the matter was, was out in, at least allegations were out in the open. Yes. Um, what we don't know is what the adverse publicity in the press was, whether it was just that there had been a hepatitis outbreak or whether it was the more detailed point about the ability to trace back. Um, but it's interesting to note that um, Professor Bloom, the director of the uh, Haemophilia Centre Directors, or the, sorry, the chairman of the Haemophilia uh, Centre Directors, uh, referred in his letter only to rumours about the origins of Humanic. He does not appear to have known uh, the exact process by which they would import the, the product. Well, if, if you write to someone like Mr Evans and say, uh, well, you, you've pressed me, so I'll tell you this is, this is really coate manufactured, or, uh, which we, we buy from a, a broker and, and put a label on it. Um, oh, they make it for us, but please keep it quiet. Um, it's bound to be at the level of rumours, I would have thought. Yes, save for the fact that um, Dr. Evans asked <coughs> and was given an answer. Yes. The only other point I would make in respect of uh, the importation of product is that no product license was obtained for CO9, which is the, the Factor 9 product, uh, and the inquiry has found no evidence that Spaywood sold CO9 in the UK. Reference should one be needed, IPSN 40139 underscore 022. I know the time, sir. Right, well, we'll take a, a break uh, now uh, until uh, 10 to 12. 10 to 12.